The online harms bill is something that's being proposed in the UK Parliament right now, and I'm not a particularly big fan of the way it's looking. It's looking like it might be the next step towards digital IDs, which is something that people have been trying, well, the government have been trying to implement and failing, thankfully, for a while in the UK. But this is one of those sorts of measures that's going to be taking us slightly further towards there. And if nothing else, if it does get passed, it will fundamentally alter the very way that everybody in the UK interacts with the internet and possibly as a result of that with a lot of the outside world as well it could restrict the kind of information that we've got available it can restrict the information channels that we're able to use so we'll go through all of that but before we do I'm just wanting to plug a recent book club that Connor and I did that I found really interesting, number 44, talking about Robert Nozick's Anarchy, State and Utopia, which is a kind of libertarian treaties on the different ideas between anarchy and state and utopia. As you can tell from the title, he goes through why anarchist state solutions or anti-state solutions won't work, his idea of the minimal and ultra-minimal state, and then his ideas of utopia. If I'm completely honest, I hated this book. I thought it was an absolute slog. I hate when people try to mathematize morality by turning it into little algebraic equations. It was bloody hard going. Plus, it also had a lot of the libertarian issues with just a complete misunderstanding of how humans behave and human nature. But it still led to some really interesting conversations. I, I am still happy to have read what I have of it because I didn't end up finishing the book, to be perfectly honest. Well, you did was, your due gil diligence. I tried. I tried yeah. my best, but it was a miserable slog, if I'm completely honest. I he has some good points uh, about anarchy, though. Yeah, he does And have also some about good taxation, but. Well, I get yeah, your I, point. I appreciate the points that he was making. If he could have just made them in a way that didn't make me want to go into hibernation, I would have felt better about it. But check that out if you've got a membership. It starts at £5, just as little as £5 for premium members so you can access all of our wonderful material that we've got available on the website. So let's get further into the news. So one of the things that put me onto this was, one, I have seen some coverage from other podcasts about this, which I found very interesting. And then also I've noticed that there seems to be a bit of a push in the mainstream media to try to manufacture some consent around the online harms bill because that what they are doing, the online harms bill is something with a rather admirable um, sentiment behind it, which is to protect children online. You know, that's a pretty reasonable thing. The intention behind it is uh, seems to me be noble, but on the mm. other hand, it is a bit suspicious because they are presenting the non, let's say, uh, the, the, the internet as um, more dangerous than it is, at least to, in its entirety. In its entirety to adults, certainly, that seems to be... A, a lot of what it seems to be to me is like the way that the Inflation Reduction Act in America didn't actually do anything to prevent inflation, but was instead a nice-sounding name so they could slip in loads of nefarious laws and legislation that people wouldn't have supported otherwise. And this seems to be something very similar to it. And like I say, as always happens, everybody's moving in lockstep with it. You get all of the big media companies producing things at the same time. For instance, this is supposedly, it, a lot of it comes from Channel 4, and Channel 4 is nothing if not subversive, as Rory loves to point out. Every subversive piece of, in, uh, of media that's come from England in the past, like, 40 years since the program, since the network started, has been incredibly subversive. This is from Hollyoaks. This is a recent clip from Hollyoaks. Uh, if you've not seen this, I had to watch it, so now you do too. Let's inflict it on everyone, John. Searching dark web for incel black pill ideology, as you do. Me and the boys mocking dead women. be on 4chan. This is what happens. This is what happened to me. He took black pill and he assimilated into the internet. So for those of you not watching and just listening instead, as I was describing there, it was a young man on his phone on the dark web search, which is just a toolbar that anybody can use, as you know. Uh, he searched for <laughs> black pilled incel ideology, which suddenly brought him to a forum where he was told to take the black pill, at which point he metaphorically took the black pill and assimilated into presumably the dark recesses of the evil internet. Look at how he looks at, the, at his phone. Yeah, this guy, he is very angry. 
the faces that they pull off. He's getting incredible. high with something before he gets the pill. Yeah, but this is this is what they always do. They try and say that if you go on the internet, if you're a young white man that's on the internet for any amount of time, you'll automatically become an incel and you'll automatically become some kind of extreme right winger that wants to uh, guy forks parliament or something or go down the street and do uh, do Joe Cox terror attacks. That's yeah. not that's not what happens. It's what that's what they want to push is happening. Whatever the uh, government does not regulate is supposed to breed bad people. I mean, exactly. there are, to be fair, there are some bad people, but it's not everyone who disagrees with the government in fact, and a its lot agenda. Of a lot of bad people d agree with the government, in fact. But then I also saw this come out around the same time. Like I said, that was, I, from what I've been told, because somebody tagged me in it, the most recent episode of Hollyoaks, and I, you know, that was the cringiest thing I'd ever seen. I think I'm kind of desensitized to it because I watched that clip a bunch in preparation to it because I didn't want to just sit here slack-jawed. But it was hard to watch, and I'm sorry I had to put you through all that. But then we also had this recently, the Kate Winslet article from the BBC where she's talking about how parents feel powerless over children's social media use. All of this is very true. And what she's talking about here is, as I mentioned, very true. And she's talking about how... You know, uh, parents feel utterly powerless about how to help their children navigate social media. But she says that she thinks that security checks and government regulation with social media enforcing age limits to help tackle impact on children's mental health is going to be the solution. The solution never seems to be parents take a bit more responsibility, take a bit more charge when you're actually talking to your kids maybe regulating their social media parents have the ability to do this but the solution is always daddy government please come in and help me which is always very frustrating because once again the government does not as you know as we all know the government does not just pass a bill that solves one problem they also sneak in 30 other agendas that they want to push at the same time so this is all precisely it's the idea that the responsibility is to be outsourced to the government or to other to others Parents aren't supposed to be responsible for their children, yeah. and they are not responsible to educate them about a world that is unsafe. And that is why we also have this uh, trend that calls for safe spaces. Yeah, I mean, this this is also coming uh, Parents up. should prepare children for unsafe places. Oh, absolutely. Otherwise, they're that's, helicopter parents. That's one of the points of being a parent in the first place, as far as I know, at least that's what my parents did, is you prepare for your kids to go out into the outside world and deal and be able to handle it to the best of their own capabilities. You don't send them out and bubble wrap every single day. But this is coming off the back of a new Channel 4 film called I Am Ruth, where Kate Winslet is starring as the mother of some depressed teenager who's actually played by her own daughter in the film, who's got social media use. I've always become very skeptical of anybody saying they want to protect children from internet abuse and other such things who also then throw their own children out into the limelight at such a young age so i'm very skeptical right there but then I, like i say i do think that it's trying to address some legitimate concerns of social media use at a young age people like jonathan Haidt have talked about how social media use is massively impacting young people's mental health how it turns everything into kind of a commodity competition you can actively measure how much other people like you or find you attractive in comparison to all of your so uh, all of your peers on social media through likes retweets comments instagram likes and followers and such so it really is negative for a lot of kids so, and perhaps some ability to regulate it or some better ability to regulate it from either the social media companies or the parents' positions is warranted. But what's going to go on with this online safety bill is going to w way overstep those boundaries. But wouldn't you say that the fact that children feel dependent for their psychology, feel that, they depend that their psychology depends upon their reception by other people as inherently as unhealthy, shouldn't I as a parent tell my children that they shouldn't care so much about what other, pe other people think, especially when uh, these other people don't know them. Yeah, I think the problem is a lot of kids nowadays, they're going to hear that from a parent and say, well, I, you can tell me not to care what other people think, but I am going to care. So it's kind of, kids are going to care no matter what. They, they can't really help it, especially when you're a teenager, you're going through so many changes. Social hierarchy in school and in other social situations is so, so, so important for a lot of kids. I think the best way Fair to do point. it is, like I say, it's to equip your kids with the sort of skills and self-esteem that they need to be able to get through it. Although if your kids are really suffering from social media, going through depression, experiencing a lot of 
bad negative effects from it. The best solution I ever saw was when I was covering Abigail Schreier's Irreversible Damage book. There was one kid who got really into gender ideology. Her mum was really scared. She was starting to talk about um, transitioning. And obviously this is not a solution for everybody. Not everybody's going to have access to this. But the mum had a family member who owned a farm. So she just sent the kid to the farm for like six months. So... so yeah rugged outdoors activity, lots of manual labor, completely disconnected from the internet, with family in a more insular community setting, really sorted the kid out. Not everybody is going to have access to those sorts of resources to be able to do something like that, but trying to get your kid out of the environment where they feel dependent on it is probably the best way to go about it. But also, as we know through Twitter, Yol Roth, all those sorts of people, a lot of internet sites that kids have access to are really dangerous do have a lot of content on there that are going to be damaging to the kids psychology so th th it's kind of difficult because you want to address this situation but the way the government is going to go about it is not going to be the right way because uh, at the bit, end of this article just to make sure that you know that it's there to push a piece of legislation it says Win winslet's comment came as the government is accused of watering down legislation aimed at regulating internet content in the past week ministers have dropped plans from the online safety bill which would require technological firms to take down legal but harmful material and that's the big sticking point that a lot of people had with the initial push for the online safety bill the fact that it had a clause in it that said we want to tackle legal but harmful which is a complete oxymoron because if you're going to tackle in legislation legal speech that's still harmful you are making it illegal as yeah. far as i'm concerned that's what i can tell at least so it takes the whole legality question out of it in the first place and like, like, like we've mentioned, it's deferring responsible parenting to government. The Conservatives released a recent tweet thread about this because it was initially introduced in 2017 under Theresa May. And it's been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. There's been a lot of pushback against it. There's been a lot of redrafts and amendments made to the bill. But it seems that it's going back through Parliament at the moment. So they've tried to make another push for it. And like I say, tried to manufacture consent for it. So they say the online safety bill has been brought back to Parliament by Michelle Donnellan, uh, or Donnellan, however you pronounce her name. Improvements by our amendment, improved by our amendments, this important bill protects and strengthens free speech online while keeping children safe. And it really doesn't strengthen free speech online. So let's just scroll through this thread just a little bit so we can... This is a very vague statement. That's okay, I mean, okay obviously it's a tweet, but uh, I'm sure there is something behind it. Most of the actual discussion I've read behind the scenes as well doesn't seem to be any less vague about it. They talk yeah. about certain aspects of it that we'll get into. So it's going to be making cyber flashing illegal. I assume this means you don't send dick pics to <laughs> women who don't ask for them. That sort of thing. That's kind of reasonable. <laughs> you know, that's fair. Uh, they're also going what to happens if uh, a female sends uh, s cyber flashes? Well, I suppose... Uh, I suppose that's also technically illegal, but that'll depend on whether you report them to the police or not. So, Or maybe there will be some regulatory body trying to uh, look in at your direct messages and private messages anyway. So uh, it, it, later on, it also mentioned that further amendments will also make it illegal to share people's intimate images without their permission. So that's revenge porn made illegal because I remember learning about this. It wasn't technically illegal because technically you had to copyright your own body first before it could be considered sharing content that other people aren't allowed to. And the actual process of copywriting your body is pretty awful and horrifying. You have to take naked photographs of yourself and send them off to the copyright body. Here is where consent is a bit tricky. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what is to be done about it. Yeah, but they're also... They, they say they're putting duties on tech companies to uphold free speech. As far as I can tell from what they've been speaking about recently, this literally just means that internet companies that will suspend you or take down certain of your posts need to have some kind of appeals system. But once again, when it's backed by a regulatory body in the government, I, I don't know how that's going to work. They, like I say, they center all of this around protecting children. They say too many young people are exposed to content promoting or encouraging self-harm. That's true, especially on websites like Tumblr. The online safety bill makes this a crime. Okay, um, what about the fact that a lot of the people promoting the self-harm are children themselves? How is that going to work? I guess we'll find out. And they also end it off just by saying that racism has no place in society offline or online. And this is where 
it really starts to come into the censorious aspects of it. The online safety bill puts new duties on tech companies that uphold and enforce their own terms and service and safety policies to keep users safe. So let's see what that actually looks like in the original white paper they put out. Not this link, the one after. We don't need to look at this link now, John, thank you. This is one that I found that I was made aware of through other streams. This is the Online Harms white paper easy read version. So as you can see, for all of the dribbling baboons that might be reading this, they've got little friendly images down the side that are all a little bit reflective of the attitudes that they want England to, to have. Oh, sorry. No, I'm just looking at the first sentence. Online harms. This is behavior online which may hurt a person physically or emotionally. So, for instance, if I upload a documentary mm -hmm. that is... Uh, a documentary about historical atrocities. It, you could say that it can hurt a person emotionally. Is that online harm? Technically, yes. But this is before they made certain amendments to it. Like I said, this was the original Easy Read white paper. So there are things in here that have been changed. For instance, this white paper does talk about the legal but harmful aspect, which has been taken out. But then, like I say, it's got such simplistic diagrams by it. I, find, I feel like this was written for children. All of the images down the side are of incredibly diverse uh, groups of people. Anybody, when they, anytime they're talking about anything negative happening, like hate being spread online, they have a little diagram of a white person doing something nasty to a black person, all that sort of stuff. It's there so that even if you're not looking at the images when you're reading through this, it's seeding these ideas in your brain. So like uh, we also have no mention throughout this of intention or accuracy, whether you know, whether it's accurate that this was intended to cause harm or not. So nice and nebulous. Um, they say too much illegal and harmful info online needs a new regulatory framework. And it even says that the people of the UK want this, which, you know, if you've got Holly Oaks and Kate Winslet drumming up support for it through television shows, because people don't actually make up their own minds about things, then yeah, you're going to manufacture enough consent for people to support it. And let's see. So they talk about democratic values and how we need to, the whole point of this online harm bill is that we need to support our own de democratic values, which are described as our ways of thinking, such as everyone being free, everyone being treated equally and fairly and freedom of speech. But they also include um, supporting foreign integration into the UK. Because if you just go to the bottom of page seven for me, this next page coming up. Uh, yeah, here we go. Scroll up. This white paper sets out to plan a, a plan of action to deal with information or activity that harms people, especially children. Also sets out a plan of action to deal with information or activity that puts our way in the life uh, of way, way of life in the UK at risk. And this can include number three there being a threat to integration in the UK. So if you're annoyed about foreign immigration, if you want the borders to close up a lot more, if you want the boats to stop coming over the channel and you post about that online, you might get targeted by the legislation that this bill is putting in place. Precisely. And this is one of the uh, problems with uh, increased regulation and centralization of uh, this network that is called the Internet, that it is easy once we give to the government the keys to the Internet. Mm -hmm. It is easy to portray everyone who is critical of the government as an enemy of the people. Yeah. So what and it is easy to present them as harming everyone. Of course, because like, like you say, it can be put in paper in one way. How it's applied in practice is going to be a completely different way, especially when what they're suggesting is that we need a regulatory body. In this white paper, they say we don't know if we need a new one or if we can refer to an old one. And from what I've been seeing recently, it seems that they're going to be deferring this regulatory duty to Ofcom, who regulate um, the terrestrial television and radio in the UK. I have worked for a local radio station in the past that was regulated by Ofcom. It is an absolute nightmare. They restrict all sorts of things for all sorts of arbitrary reasons. There is mountains of red tape that you need to get through. They, they have very strange rules like you're allowed to swear, but only at certain times of the day in certain contexts. And then it's very nebulous as to whether you're ever actually going to fit that. So everybody just refrains from swearing altogether. And like all other big government bodies, it is full of woke leftists. And and you're describing the situation right now. In the future, it could get even more restrictive. Oh, it will, it will get worse because we've got to remember they're trying to implement this under a conservative government. 
if anybody tries to convince me that the Conservatives are going to win the next election, I've got a bridge to sell you. Because the Conservatives have been useless for 12 years. They broke every promise they ever made. Boris Johnson was the last hope, and then he turned around and screwed everybody over who voted for him. The Red Wall is coming back. We made terrible losses during the most recent um, by-election. So Labour's going to come in. They're going to have this legislation ready and waiting for them, if it gets passed, to expand it even further. Suddenly it won't be threat to integration is one of the things that's anti-UK. All of a sudden being anti-UK is celebrating traditions and cultures local to parts of Britain. It's going to end up expanding further and further. It's going to be, it's, it's going to be a terrible idea. And like I say, so it says all of the onus will be on the companies to do what the regulator says. But like I say, the only true way to enforce, especially if it's going to be for the purpose of age restriction so that you can prevent kids from seeing harmful material online, they're going to ask all of these social media companies to implement age restrictions, which will be down to the regulator. The only way to do that across all of the different companies that they're going to have to is they're going to say, well, you're going to need a digital ID if you want to use the internet to prove that you are the age that you say that you are. This is just a way of slipping the digital IDs in through the back door because that's the only way to um, implement it fully what they'll probably end up doing is saying something like if you're in the uk and you want to get internet access and you need to speak to an internet provider so that you can buy your wi-fi or whatever you're going to need to present them with your new digital id prove you are the age that you are and then with an the introduction of a digital id it will not just stop at proving that you're old enough to use certain social media websites. And plus there's the fact, if we go to the next link as well, that it doesn't just end at social media websites, it also talks about how online services will be designated as a category 1, 2A or 2B services. Their category will be dependent on a number of users on on the number of users and the functionalities of that service. However, the thresholds for each category have not yet been determined and will be set out in secondary legislation. So this is recent. This is from the end of last month where the LGA, the local government associations, which is just 331 of the councils of England talking about what they would like to see as part of this. Crucially, only services that are user to user services and internet services which allow users to generate, upload or share content and meet category one thresholds will be subject to additional duties. And think about it, because that will necessarily include people like us as well. Mm. All of a sudden, we're under the remit of the Ofcom regulators. I know we obviously have to censor some of the things that we talk about for the sake of YouTube's terms of service, but we also have our premium content where we are allowed to be a little bit more loose and a little bit more direct with the sorts of uh, topics that we discuss. All of a sudden, that doesn't necessarily count. And what we instead have to do is submit to the whims of wokists in Ofcom. Yes, because everything that it doesn't re uh, reproduce woke ideology is harming. Exactly. As if uh, what uh, Biden's agenda at the moment with uh, transitioning kids isn't harming. Yeah, we're going to talk, um, we, we talk about that sort of stuff and then all of a sudden Ofcom says that we're not allowed to talk about stuff. We appeal and say this is a restriction of our freedom of speech and then all of a sudden we've got a Labour government in power saying, well actually the speech that you're talking about is harmful to certain communities so yeah, it but doesn't count as free speech. What does harm even mean? Well that's the thing, isn't it? The, the, the definition Nowadays, of harm is incredibly nebulous and they even include a little section talking about it here saying uh, an example of what harm means an amendment that would require the secretary of state's designation of priority content that is harmful to adults to include public health related misinformation so if you want to complain about lockdowns and such can't do that anymore even more so than it was already under twitter we wouldn't have even be able to do it on our website, for instance, or disinformation and misinformation or disinformation spread by a foreign state. We know exactly the sorts of things they're talking about when they talk about misinformation and disinformation. They're talking about the sorts of websites and, uh, and ideologies and internet cultures that people can get into, like the ones that they presented at the beginning of this, where on Hollyoaks, where it's black pill incel ideology, which according to these morons who don't really know what that is or are very have vested interests in making it anything that opposes them, they will just turn into, all of a sudden, we're a black pill incel ideology. So let me understand. Uh, they define harm in terms of hurtful action. Yes. And they define hurtful action in terms of ill intentions. And ill intention has to do with the spreading of misinformation. Yes. The deliberate spreading of misinformation. So how do they know if, for instance, let's, let's say I'm wrong about something. 
and I, I speak my in mind. In good faith. In, in good faith. How do they know that I'm doing so in, Ill, with bad intentions? Well, it doesn't matter because they never mentioned anything to do with intentionality as part of this legislation. So you just go out there, you make a good faith, but possibly misinformed or possibly you were miscalculated something when you were coming up with your conclusions on a particular subject. All of a sudden, you've either got a fine against you or you're just blocked from accessing that website that you shared it on altogether. So this is a massive restriction of free speech, because Ofcom is not a neutral organization. Just because they're a government regulatory body, there is no such thing as a neutral organization. Ofcom is filled with human beings. Human beings have agendas. Human beings, these people with agendas, they will hire other people that reflect their agendas. So you get the woke people at the top, and then they just hire woke people. That's what happens, and then all of a sudden they're in charge of what even we're allowed to talk about. So it's not looking great. I do not like this legislation. And uh, like I say, it is back in Parliament recently. The Conservatives were talking about it. There was this Guardian article talking about it. And the return of the bill will not see it progress rapidly through Parliament in the next link, link if you just want to show this, John. They say it won't progress rapidly through Parliament, Digital Minister Paul Scully has said, as it will instead be sent back to committee stage for deeper scrutiny. Origi and like I say, it's originally proposed by Theresa May. Uh, the bill has survived four prime ministers and seven departmental secretaries to reach this point. That should show you just how desperate they are to get this through. It doesn't matter that the government has changed multiple times, four different prime ministers, seven different secretaries, have been presiding over this bill, they all want it. It doesn't matter what other agendas they might want to push, they all want this. And I don't think it'll be good for anybody. And uh, like I say, the next government as well, if they do manage to get this passed, will be Labour. So it will be even more strictly enforced. The only thing that could give me hope about this is that if it is not passed by April 2023, it will be dropped entirely and the process will need to be started from scratch in a new parliament. So I can only hope that they can't get it passed till then. Until then, the best thing that I can recommend that people might be able to do about this, seeing as the local councils are supporting this, maybe get in touch with your local MP, maybe get in touch with your local council and let them know you don't want this legislation. Just let them know you respect the whole protecting children thing. I think we can all get behind that. But there is a lot of very dangerous stuff in this bill that will restrict free speech, whether or not they want to advertise it as strengthening free speech. If I may have a comment, I yeah, think yeah. that it is important to protect children. Of course. And uh, we should be very responsible about it. We and often this, talk about it on, the, on, on this very show. Precisely. And um, it's important to be very careful about what is to be done here. But regardless of how we are going to go up forward with this, I think that this is a manifestation of the liberty versus security debate. Mm -hmm. And I think that in general, the pendulum has swung way too much towards the side of security. Well, yes. Uh, of I mean course, we all want security for our lives, but freedom is something wor worth protecting. Yeah, and freedom comes with and responsibility. should be emphasized. I, I, exactly. This is, and this is why I think that uh, parents should try to foster the, to kids the, the idea that they are responsible. Yeah, I think liberty in the classical sense was always talking about how true freedom is being able to restrict and regulate your own behavior so that you engage in habits of virtue, so that you're a boon to your community rather than just being some selfish, atomized individual who's nothing but a drain from everybody. Offloading all responsibility to the state is just something that is going to further encourage people to atomize themselves. If we get state legislation going in and doing this, we are telling parents you do not need to respect, you, you do not need to raise your children in a responsible way. You don't need to instill these values yourself because the government will just do it for you. That's not what's going to help anybody. We hope you enjoyed that segment from the podcast The Lotus Eaters and would like to wish you a very Merry Christmas. If you're stuck for gift ideas this year, you can go over and look at our merch store, which we've just launched. It's available via lotusseasers.com and at the website merch.lotusseasers.com where you can get everything from t-shirts to pillowcases to mugs and hoodies. So enjoy. If you'd like to keep up to date with all of our new releases, you can go and follow us on Getter at lotuseasers underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.